Anything Goes Show, number 305. When my family, my father and mother, and my brother and I first moved into the house, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. We got our furniture in, and Mom and Dad decided that we would unpack our clothing and such the next morning. They had set up for bed for my brother and I, and started to get ready for bed themselves. I had left my brother there as I went to brush my teeth. He was fine. When I came back, however, he was not. He was sobbing in his hands. When I asked what the problem was, he said that there was a ghost standing at the door. Welcome to Anything Ghost. My name is Lex Wall. Anything Ghost is a podcast where people share their personal paranormal experiences. That's a lot of he's. And I share them with you on the show. If you have a story you want to share, a personal ghost story or a local ghost legend, send them to Lex at anythingghost.com. L-E-X at anythingghost.com. I'm running a little late this month on Anything Ghost, but I hope you enjoy episode number 305. first story we have is from Chetan or Chetna. I'm not sure of the pronunciation. And it's called The Haunting Melody. Unveiling the Unexplained. In the tranquil haven of an all-girls hostel, nestled at the secluded end of a road enveloped by towering trees, an eerie tale unfolds. It was the time when I was on the verge of completing my high school graduation just before the relentless force of COVID-19 propelled the world into a state of lockdown. This hostel, serving as my home throughout high school, offered shelter to a community of 100 to 120 girls, with each room shared by two for security purposes. Located away from the bustling main road, the surroundings excluded an air of calmness and serenity intentionally designed to facilitate focused studying. Adjoined by a peaceful park and with a nearby temple, the hostel seemed shielded from the outside world. As news of the impending pandemic spread, a wave of caution prompted most of the girls to return to the safety of their homes. Only a few, myself and my roommate included, remained behind unable to make the journey just yet. The once vibrant corridor, bustling with life, now stood eerily empty. In ordinary times, I, as a science major, scoffed at the idea of ghosts, spirits, and other supernatural entities. Such concepts seem nothing more than mere superstitions. However, my roommate held deep-rooted beliefs in positive vibes, negative auras, and the supernatural realm. Aware of her disposition, I often found amusement in attempting to scare her with spooky images, eerie songs, and other playful pranks. On one fateful night, left alone in our room, I embarked on a mischievous quest to find the perfect song that would send shivers down my roommate's spine. With the music app Wink at my disposal, which had conveniently been free at the time, I delved into a search for spine-chilling tunes. Scrolling through the vast collection, I stumbled upon a song called Bloody Bath. Its mere presence excluded an uncanny aura, with a poster featuring a ghostly figure donned in a flowing white dress, hair wildly cascading. The image alone sent shivers racing down my spine. Intrigued by its unsettling nature, I dared to test its scare factor and began playing the song. However, 
As the haunting melody unfolded, my nerves betrayed me. Midway through, I abruptly ceased its playback, overwhelmed by an indescribable fear. Desperate to divert my thoughts from the disturbing experience, I turned to more soothing music and endeavored to immerse myself in my studies. Yet to my horror, each time I stepped away from my phone, the dreaded song resumed its ghastly symphony. Fear gripped me, prompting me to sever the internet connection. After all, I hadn't even downloaded the song. It should have been impossible for it to continue playing. But the ghastly melody persisted, haunting me relentlessly. Paralyzed with terror, I eventually switched off my phone, anxiously awaiting my roommate's return. The clock struck 7 p.m., and darkness descended upon the corridor as my roommate finally entered the room. Trembling, I recounted the spine-chilling events that had unfolded in her absence. In an effort to console me, she cautiously switched on my phone, only to witness the return of the ghostly song playing once more. This escalation of events intensified my terror as my panic-stricken gaze pleaded for an explanation. Sensing my stress, my roommate assured me that my own panic might have prevented me from properly stopping the song. With determination, she promptly removed the song, deleting it from my recommendations, search history, and every trace of its existence. Believing the ordeal to be over, my roommate then chose our favorite song, and, with a sense of solace, she departed from the room. But as soon as she left, the room was once again besieged by the eerie melody. Fear consumed me entirely, pushing me to flee the confines of our room in search of my roommate. Yet upon her return, a sweet and innocuous tune serenaded our ears, replacing the malevolent melody. Perplexed but resolute, we attempted to locate the recently played list, only to discover that the haunting song had vanished without a trace. Our subsequent efforts to find it on the internet proved futile. With my roommate having meticulously erased any remnants of the song from our search history and recommendations, it seemed as though the ghostly melody had been banished forever. Now, three long years have passed since that inexplicable incident. Wink music has become a distant memory, especially since it is no longer free. My academic path has shifted to the realm of computer science engineering, and my skepticism toward ghosts and the supernatural remains unwavering. Nevertheless, the episode serves as a chilling reminder that not everything can be rationalized or explained by scientific principles I hold dear. The memory of that encounter lingers a testament to the inexplicable and mysterious forces that occasionally transverse our lives, forever defying comprehension. Yeah, next up is a story sent in by Annie in Wisconsin, the Boy Scout Camp Ghost. I've been listening to you for seven years now, and just became a VIP recently, so I decided to finally send in my story. To understand some things, you'll need to know that this was a scout camp, and it was next to a lake in Wisconsin, and it gets cold at night. On one occasion, me and three other people in my troop were in our tents. My tent mate and me had a normal tent, and the other two had a canvas A-frame tent. It was my tent mate Marcus and me, and the other two were Stephen and Aaron. Stephen had to have a net around his cot so he wouldn't sleepwalk. It was ten minutes to lights out when we walked into our tents. Aaron and Stephen went to sleep immediately 
while Marcus and me both read our books for another 30 minutes. In that 30 minutes, we heard an abrupt, loud scream. I looked over to Marcus, and he looked startled, and he yelled out to them. There was no response, so I yelled out to them. Still, no response. But we wrote it off as it being the sound from a beach staff member, as they were right next door, and we kept reading. Soon we decided to go to sleep and shut the lights off. A couple minutes later, we heard the sound of a hand brushing against our tent. There were no lights outside, and it was 11.30 at night, so it was pitch black. I could faintly see the outline of a hand going around the tent and then disappearing. Whatever did that didn't trip like a normal person. It just crunched the leaves on the ground and was brushing the tent. I didn't sleep that night. In the morning, we asked Aaron and Steve if they had screamed or walked around our tent, but they said they were both dead asleep. We didn't believe them, and we checked Stephen and Aaron's socks for leaves. There was nothing there. Another weird thing was that me and Stephen couldn't sleep the night after that incident, and Marcus and Aaron couldn't sleep two nights after that incident. And I believe what Annie was trying to say was that the ghost was walking along the side of the tent with its hand rubbing. And she was trying to say that that wasn't a person using the tent so they wouldn't trip. But it was that she thought it was a ghost because it was walking with purpose and just running its hand against the tent just to be creepy, I guess. But that's the story from Wisconsin. Thank you, Annie. And this is a story from our archive. And there's actually two of them. The first, they're both from Michael in Lincoln, Nebraska. And this was from episode number 164 in October, the Halloween episode of 2012. It's called A Haunted House in Nebraska. Many members of my family and myself have had experiences with the paranormal. I've often wondered if we're susceptible to this or if we simply are lucky or unlucky to be seen and hearing what we've seen. I'm just going to go with one example of what I personally experienced in an apartment house near Westland College in Lincoln. It was 1987, and I was 11 years old. My brother and I shared a bedroom and a bed. We always took turns sleeping on either side of the bed, so one could be near the fan that ran all night. On this particular night, I remember being restless and seemingly excited for something the next day, my birthday or Christmas, something. My brother was a heavy sleeper, and it was very difficult to wake him. As I was lying in bed, I saw a woman walk through the bedroom door from the living room. She resembled my mother very much, long dark hair, about 5'3" and was wearing what looked like one of the novelty nightshirts my mother used to wear. As she walked into the room, I sat up and said out loud, Mom? No response. I don't actually think she was making her way toward me until I said again, Mother? Then she turned and headed her way toward me. As she got no less than two feet away from my bed, she simply vanished. At that point, I screamed for my mother, who came in and convinced me that I was dreaming. But I knew I was not. I won't go into everything that happened in that house, but just one more thing. My mother would have a recurring nightmare in which she would wake up and the kitchen would be on fire. Well, we later found out that the house burned down no sooner than two weeks after we moved. The landlord told us that the only part of the upstairs that had any damage was the kitchen. I later did some research and found that the house was once a hospice building. I still find myself going back to the spot where the house once stood. 
and I always feel a presence there. I've asked anybody living in the new apartments if they've had any experiences. Maybe someday I will. And then here's a second story from Michael in Nebraska. Scratching at the Bedroom Door. Episode 185, December 29th, 2013. A story I told you about last year was about an experience that I had in a haunted apartment house I lived in here in Lincoln, Nebraska. This story took place in the same location. When my family, my father and mother, and my brother and I first moved into the house, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. We got our furniture in, and Mom and Dad decided that we would unpack our clothing and such the next morning. They had set up for bed for my brother and I, and started to get ready for bed themselves. I had left my brother there as I went to brush my teeth. He was fine. When I came back, however, he was not. He was sobbing in his hands. When I asked what the problem was, he said that there was a ghost standing at the door and added that he was not going to sleep on that side of the bed. He was only seven at the time and I figured he was letting his imagination get away from him. So to shut him up, I told him I'd sleep on that side for the night. As I mentioned in my last story, my brother was a heavy sleeper and it was difficult to wake him once he fell asleep. As I was lying there trying to fall asleep in our new apartment, I began to hear what sounded like scratching on the other side of the door that my bed was pressed against. I won't go into why my bed was up against a door. Let's just say the apartment had a lot of doors in it. Every room, every side, connected with a door. I got up out of bed to go into the room that would later serve as our playroom and my mother's laundry room to investigate the sound of the scratching. I opened the door and turned on the light, but nothing was there. I turned to go back into my room and noticed a cold sort of breeze in the hallway there. When I came into my room, there on the floor were all of the sheets and blankets from our bed. Even the pillow my brother was lying on and my brother was just lying there sleeping like nothing had happened. I picked everything up, crawled into bed, and was trying to wake up my brother to ask him if he had seen anything at all, but he wouldn't wake up. Many things happened in that house. Some invisible force had run across the bottom of our bed one night, shaking it violently. My father and I both witnessed our ancient turn-knob-style TV come on by itself and start turning channels. One night when my father got up late to use the restroom, he found all of the doors to all of the rooms, including his, were shut, and he hadn't heard a sound. We would all hear our names called from the farthest room from where everyone was, and we could often hear children laughing and women and men sobbing. But the scratching at the door never stopped. Every night, like clockwork, I never figured it out. Okay, those are two nice little haunted house stories that came from, um, sorry, Michael in Lincoln, Nebraska. And... That's it for the stories of the Anything Ghost archive. We're going to continue now with some more new stories of Anything Ghost. And then I have some uh, videos I'm going to review. Not really review, but share. They're from TikTok, actually. So stick around for all of that. And here we have a story from Beto in Mexico. And he's written in before in the past. This one's called Milky Eye. When I was about eight, next door, there lived an elderly woman and her daughter. Because of her age and appearance, the kids in the area said she was a witch. 
and you know at that age I believed it. When I turned nine, I had my little birthday party with some of my friends. At the end of the party, my mom cut a piece of cake and sent it to me next door. The mother of the neighbor's house answered the door. When I explained the reason for the cake, she said, Oh, it's your birthday. Well, I have a present for you. Won't you come in? To be honest, I was more curious than scared to enter the house. I had no idea what to expect to see. It turned out to be a pretty normal room. However, by the entrance, there was a big table filled with lots of toys. Most of the toys were old and broken, mind you, but some looked to be in good condition. The woman said I could have one, and I took an action figure. Unfortunately, a couple years later, the old woman died and her daughter moved out. Shortly afterward, a big family moved in, and one of their kids, Mateo, became good friends with my big brother. When they were in their late teens, Mateo, my brother, and other kids from the neighborhood went swimming in a small town called Los Ramones. This place was famous for its river. So they spent some hours in the river, and then they got hungry. They walked into town looking for something to eat. They saw a woman sitting on her porch, and she told them where they could go. As they walked to the convenience store, they mentioned the woman's eyes to each other. Did you see? One of her eyes was completely white, said one of them. They arrived at the store and bought some snacks, and the woman in that place also had a white eye. They started to feel nervous, so they decided to come back to Monterey. Mateo told everyone in the group what his mother had told him, that when a woman had an eye like that, it meant she was a witch. Nothing serious happened that day to the boys, just the creepy feeling. Oh, I forgot to mention that the elderly woman who gave us the toy had a green eye and a white one. Back in the 70s and 80s in Mexico, there was a comic book intended for adults. It was called Erme Linda Linda. They even made a movie that you can watch scenes on YouTube. It's an adventure of a witch, not a very attractive woman, but she has a milky eye. I know my story is not scary, but those were the series of coincidences. Okay, and that's from Beto in Mexico. And uh, I apologize. I know that when someone says the word witch, it's kind of an insult to people who study that. But I hope you don't mind me sharing that story. Okay, thanks, Beto. And next up, I'm going to share an audio file that was sent to me by Matt. And he's sent us a story before. And here's Matt. Hello, Lex. Um, and all of you um, Anything Ghost listeners. Um, I had a uh, story or two to tell you uh, last month. Well, it just came out this month. So um, it's about a house we bought. And it's pretty, pretty well haunted. Um, nothing really horrible. Just some scratches and some bruises and and a lot of um voices and knockings and and cryings and um things like that it's definitely haunted i've been um I, this this veil has been open to me since i was a kid and i'll tell you the first time i remember i was at the unity cemetery in late trobe pennsylvania and my mom was driving and i noticed an old man a really old man he was very bent over and he had a black suit on, head to toe, and he had a black Abraham Lincoln hat on, but it wasn't as tall. And he was walking behind the gravestones. And I told my mom, look at that man. And she said, couldn't find him. I said, well, he's going around the tree right now, this small birch tree. And he went behind the tree, and he never came out the other side. So that was my first experience. And a couple of weeks later, we were there putting flowers on our grandma, grandma's grave, and um, I busted away from my mom somehow and wound up in a, in a mausoleum. And I was in there for about two hours, from daylight till dusk. And 
Uh, I didn't cry. I wasn't very upset. Um, but I did have to yell for the maintenance man to come find me. And of course, I got in all kinds of trouble. But um, yeah, I, I never want to experience that again. But I did hear a lot of things in there. I heard whispers, and but I, I saw nothing. So uh, fast forward years and years and years, my wife got married to me, and we had three kids, and we rented a house. Um, we rented a house on Sloane, wait, Tacoma Avenue, real small, small house. It's uh, the house we lived in before this house, and it was very, very oppressive and depressive house, and. We lived there for eight years, and for those eight years, I personally was tormented. For example, um, a young girl died in that house. She had overdosed in the bathroom upstairs, and her, her little boy found her. Well, I came home from work one day, and she's looking out the window. It was about eight o'clock at night. She's just looking out the window. I knew who she looked like, because I knew her. And she backed off, and she just disappeared. Um, another night, I came home late. It was about three in the morning. I opened the door, tried to be quiet because my family was sleeping, and there stood this giant tall person in the um, uh, in the overhang of the door, the door overhang, standing there, kind of looking like Michael Myers, if you if you will. And I wasn't scared at all, but I took a step towards him, and he disappeared. And then I lost it. I got really scared. So I went up to where he was standing to see if I could feel any energy or cold. And sure enough, I felt cold there. But then I turned my head to the left and about 10 feet away, he was standing in the same position in the kitchen. He disappeared. So I hadn't seen him after that. <clears throat> now two other times, well, several times in this house, I'd have terrible dreams about an old lady crying from the basement, let me up, help me up. And I'd actually go to the basement and open the door and I see this lady down there. I know it wasn't a dream and she'd say, help me up, help me up. Uh, where They locked me down here and I just close the door and go back to bed. Creepy as anything. Um, another time my wife was in the bathroom, I was laying in the bedroom and I lifted up and I saw this old withered hag. She was wearing a brown cloak over her head but you could see her eyes and her face. And she had her head down, but she was staring right at me in the bed. She was about two feet away from Kelly, my wife, and about eight feet away from me lying in bed. And I said, Kelly, can you not see this? Look, look, can you not see? She could not see anything. She couldn't see anything. And below her were her these pair of black shoes and a big hole in the ground. It was a, a linoleum floor, but the linoleum wasn't there. It was just a hole in the ground, like a portal is what I'm figuring. So Kelly came scared. She came in, turned the light on, it disappeared. I said, turn that light back off right now. So she turned it off, it came back. And there again, it didn't scare me. It just, it just, um, these things just don't scare me too much because I've seen them a lot. Our daughter came home one day and she said, I know somebody used to live here. And I already knew this news already in my head, but I didn't, Kelly and I didn't tell her. Somebody, a man, had taken his own life, but before he did take his own life, he tried to take his girlfriend's life, and she got out of the way in the dining room. So he took his own life in the dining room. And I went, Bailey came home and told me my daughter, and I said, what did this guy look like? And she subscribed him to a T, to a T. He was almost seven feet tall. He was, he was a, an African American guy, and uh, see, I had already seen him from the bed, and he was just leaning against the wall with his foot against the wall, and um, he was looking at what I thought was a, a cell phone because it was glowing in his face, and then I grabbed a golf club. I, my wife woke up to go to work. It was about six in the morning. I grabbed a golf club. I said, "We're being robbed." So I grabbed a golf club, and when I did, this creature took two steps forward, moved to the right, and then took four steps backwards, moved into the dining room where he took his own life, and just disappeared. We searched the whole house. The house was totally locked up, and nobody was there. So somebody said, 
his closer in the eaves in the attic. So I went up with an EVP player, you know, my phone, started asking questions. And I said, <clears throat> hey, I, I heard you died here, and I, I, I might be able to help you get out of here. And just then, you know, after you play it back, you hear the voices. You hear this man say, you can't help me now. And I said, where are your clothes? He said, they're back in the eaves. So I, I didn't even hear this until I played it later. And it freaked my daughter out. She told my, my wife. And uh, so I went back after everybody was gone. And I found a pair of clothes. And they were bloody. Some of them are bloody. So I don't know what they, how they disposed of this guy's body. Another time I came in the house. And I heard laughing up the, up the bedroom stairs. And it sounded like my daughter Bailey and her friend. So um, I said, hey, Bailey, what are you doing? No answer. A little louder. Hey, Bailey, what are you doing? No answer. Finally, I said, Bailey. And when I did, I heard, what? But it came out from the kitchen. It didn't come from the downstairs. That freaked me out. So I had to run upstairs. Nobody was up there, but that's what they were doing up there. The upstairs is a place where between two and three, almost every night, we would hear footprint, footsteps or balls like marbles bouncing or tennis balls bouncing or things dragging like a chain or a desk or something. We'd hear it constantly and it freaked us out. Another time, a psychic came to the house and she said, I don't, I don't know how I got your name. I just got your name and I found your address and I'm here to help you. And she grabbed my hand. She said, oh, my Lord. She said, you've got strength. You've got some kind of energy. And I said, why do you say that? I didn't even know if I should have let her in, but she was a little old lady. And uh, she said, your energy is going up my hand, down my back, uh, above my rear end. And I don't even want to let, it, want to let you go. She said, you see, see, you see things, don't you? And I said, I do sometimes. And she said, I'm going to take a walk around your house. And first thing she said is, who's Freddie? And I said, Freddie? I said, my dad's name's Fred. He died a couple years ago. She said, well, Freddie, Fred, and they call him Freddie. Fred is here watching with you. He's always with you. And, and, he, and she said, something terrible happened in this dining room. So she walked to the dining room, and she, says, she said, there's blood everywhere. All over the walls, all over the dressers, the table. She said, somebody was murdered in here. And there was, there was a, a murder. There was a suicide in there. And uh, we talked about that. We went to the staircase, and she looked up at that uh, um, bathroom up at the top of the stairs where the young girl overdosed, that her son found her. And she said, wow, she's pretty. Can you see her? I said, no, I couldn't see her. But I knew what she was talking about. She said, she is pale, and she's not with us anymore. But she died of something bad. I said, an overdose? She said, yes. So she saw it. And she said, uh, also an elderly couple lived here and died. So um, this woman was real. She's from Baltimore. I don't think she's with us anymore. Um, I tried to get her to come out here. Um, and I can't find her name anymore. So, um, you know, I went outside. Or no, I was coming in the house with my friend Mike. And, um, and my son came in the house. He went upstairs. And when I came in the house... Our whole dining room was trashed. Everything was laying upside down, trashed. Now, no, my son had no time to do that. I followed him. I followed him right in. The whole room was trashed. The paintings were off the wall. The dishes were broken. The, the, t the table leaf was out. The chairs were upside down. It was a disaster. We still don't know what happened and and who did that. And another time, we we're sitting at that very table telling. Uh, our friends about how haunted this house is and my wife said pictures fall off the wall and just as she said that a big picture fell off the wall upstairs in my daughter's bedroom I used to watch the Steeler game every Sunday and three straight weeks I'd be watching it and I glance over something told me to glance over to the corner of the um, doorway and I would see this red Looked like a clown face, completely red, with a red nose. And it would just, as soon as I saw it, it would go away. And that happened three weeks in a row. 
and I ran after it the third week in a row, and there was no nobody there. Nothing was there. So I don't know what that was. This this place is a legitimate haunted house, and I could not wait to get out of there. As soon as I did and moved into this new place, I felt like a brand new man. My depression left. It was just wonderful. The veils lifted for me. I don't know why. I don't know why. If it was because of the um, acupuncturist or what. But this veil is lifted and it's a wonderful thing to see. But it's also not. So I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And if I could take it away, I probably would just to be normal. Um, but that's just a few stories. Um, I have some more. I have a bunch of EV EVPs that were taken at Livermore, Pennsylvania. And that's where they shot the movie, The Night of the Living Dead. So, but I have all these EVPs. They're, they're pigs snorting. There's girls talking at a party. There's gunshots going off. There's all sorts of things. And I would like to share these things with you someday. Maybe Lex can let me know how. But anyhow, Lex, again, buddy, you do a great job. And I thank you for putting me on last time. And um, I look forward to sending you some more. And um, <clears throat> these might sound crazy, but they're totally true. Um, so you guys take care. Keep, on, keep up with the good work, Lex. And you listeners, keep on listening. Keep on sending it to Lex because he needs some stuff. He's running out, it seems like. So uh, God bless you all. God bless you, Lex. And you guys all take care. All righty. Bye. And as I alluded to earlier, I'm going to describe some videos that are related to ghosts that I found. And these two were on TikTok, but I'll try to find maybe YouTube links. This one is, I call it, Dog Runs to Grandmother's Grave. And here's the audio. I'll tell you about it in a sec. So this is really messed up, but we let Wes off leash and he went directly to mom's grave. He never, on a leash. He never knew, he, he's never been here before. He knows exactly where to go. And I'll have links. I don't know if I mentioned this, but I'll have links to these videos at anythingghost.com under this episode number 305. And this audio was from a TikTok video that came out in, I think, February of 2023. And the video was regarding their golden doodle, which if you doesn't, don't know what a golden doodle is, it's a designer dog bred by crossbreeding a golden retriever and some scribbles on a piece of paper. Uh, just kidding. It's a golden retrieval retriever <laughs> mixed with a poodle. And the golden doodle's name in the video is Wes. W-E-S. The video shows Wes standing between the graves in a snow-covered cemetery, but after a few moments, Wes finally lies down. And some viewers pointed out that Wes appears to be eating something just before laying down and suggesting that the video is a fake. But I was thinking maybe they were reenacting the whole thing because he ran out there. So maybe they left him a treat to keep him standing there to show where he was. And also, he may have been eating snow. I know our dogs have eaten snow in the past. But anyway, I don't, I don't think the video is fake. But it was shared by the member Wes, the best doodle on TikTok. And the author says, as you heard, it was Wes's first time meeting our mom. And he ran straight to her grave. My mom passed away in 2012. And we got Wes in 2020. He's never met her in person before or been to her grave before. This is so weird. And then some of the comments were, Alexander wrote, uh, lost my place here. Oh, my Sophie did the same thing with my Nana. And Nance wrote, this happened to my mother-in-law and her dog ran to her mother's grave first time at the graveyard. And then Hurstony wrote, my dog did this too with my dad's grave. It's true, they know. My dad sent me my dog. And then W wrote, My dog did the same thing too. He never met my sister, and he knew where her grave was. Now when we go, he always cries when he's near. And Jane wrote, My husky went straight to my brother's grave too. He'd never been there before, 
and never met my brother. So I found the video interesting. And maybe that's something some of you will want to try with your pup someday. Okay, and the last thing I'm going to share for episode number 305 is the second video that I wanted to share with you. And I thought it was a creepy looking ghost. It's uh, somebody's got a bonfire going outside and then somebody's panning around with their phone, I guess. And then you see this creepy image of what looks like a person or a ghost floating toward the fire. It's pretty, pretty cool looking. So check out the link at anythingghost.com. And here's the audio. It's, I'm just going to play a little bit. It's just the fire cracking and then somebody calling the dog. But you'll understand it when you see the video and then I'll tell you about it. And actually, that was all of the audio. I thought I was kind of eerie just listening to it. But anyway, so in this video, a couple and their dog, Aliko, A-L-I-K-O, were outside in the snow with a rather large bonfire roaring. Erica is videotaping the scene and then pans to their dog, Aliko, Aliko <laughs> who was off away from the fire, snooping and looking in the forest. But suddenly the dog began looking at something in the direction of the fire. Erica slowly pans in the direction the dog's looking, and the video shows her friend adding wood to the fire, a male. But out of nowhere, to the left of the fire, in the snow, near where the dog was looking, a creepy, misty image of a white figure, kind of human-like, appears and floats toward the fire and then disappears. And the video had a lot of views and comments, some people brought up that as soon as the ghost goes into the fire, the burning wood makes a pop sound and moves around. Someone else said the smoke turned green on the right side of the fire after the ghost walked into it. And one viewer, Amanda, wrote, Believe it or not, fire helps them move on. To which Erica replied, There were a lot of Native Americans that commented on this video. That is what they believe as well. And then, so yeah, check out this one. I, I really like the ghostly figure, whether, you know, maybe it was the light from her phone as she was panning. Maybe she had her, her light on, but it's really cool. It's one of my favorite ghost videos that I've seen. But anyway, that's all I have for episode number 305 of Anything Ghost. I'll talk to you in show number 306, 306 of Anything Ghost. If you have a story you want to share, send it to Lex at anythingghost.com or fill out the form at anythingghost.com and don't forget I didn't mention that I have a VIP group there's a one-time membership fee and once you pay that small fee you'll have complete access to the Anything Ghost archive check that out at anythingghost.com join VIP okay everyone have yourself a wonderful end of summer and until next month or whatever maybe i'll get showered with stories and i'll come out with one earlier but until then take care